everyone. I hope you all are doing well. I hope you are able to access this video easily. Hope you're all safe. Hope you're all healthy. And hopefully this mini lecture will both help elucidate the intricacies of Thomas Hobbes' conception of the state of nature and human, and human nature, and also give you, more importantly, something else to think about and focus your time on. Um, today's le mini lecture is going to be divided into three parts. I'll have little parts where uh, you can, or I'll, you know, pause, give you a chance to pause the video and come back to it if you don't want to listen, sit through the thing, the whole lecture in one setting. So let's go ahead and get started. So today uh, we are moving forward a good century or so into the future to the uh, 17th century to look at Thomas Hobbes' uh, canonical work of political theory, Leviathan. Um, today we're going to be focusing on book one of Leviathan, uh, Hobbes' conception of human nature. And we're going to be focusing mostly on how this account of human nature is different from the way that the ancient thinkers uh, conceived of human nature. And if you hear some noise in the background, that's just my dog who decided that she wanted to hang out with me and chew a bone while I recorded this. Uh, I figured that that was better than her just barking in the background outside of this office. So let's go ahead and get started by contextualizing Hobbes a little bit. And this will be the first of the three main sessions of, sections of this lecture that I was talking about. It's impossible to talk about Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan without thinking about the context of the English Civil Wars, which took place between 1642 and 1651. Um, it's often called the English Civil War or the English Revolution, but it's actually a series of conflicts, um, both political and military, between parliamentarians, also known as the Roundheads, and Royalists, those defending the English monarchy or the Cavaliers. Uh, and this was a civil war basically fought over how much authority Parliament should have in determining the affairs of state. The first and second civil wars, uh, the first fought between 1642 and 1646, and the second between 1648 and 1649, uh, they pitted uh, supporters of the parliament against King Charles I. And while the third, uh, which took place between 1649 and 1651, uh, like, was conflict between uh, King Charles II and supporters of the Rump Parliament. Ultimately, this uh, this concluded in a victory for Parliament uh, in the trial and execution of Charles I, the exile of his son Charles II, and the creation of a Commonwealth or Republic of, of England, um, but that eventually devolved into the protectorate of Oliver Cromwell. Um, and so this conflict really transformed English governance uh, as, as we know it uh, and really altered the balance of power. And it wouldn't really be concluded until 1688 um, with the Glorious Revolution that we'll talk about next week when we talk return to John Locke. Now, I am not going to give you a long and detailed history of the English Civil Wars. I'm going to instead focus on some of the key causes and consequences as they matter for our discussion of Hobbes. One set of causes is a religious dispute between Catholics and Protestants. Uh, since Henry VIII, the King of England was also the head of the Church of England, and as a distinct Christian denomination from the Roman uh, that was distinct from the Roman Catholic Church, uh, and there was a general skepticism of Catholicism for as much as political as religious reasons. Um, they were concerned that the King might be more loyal if he were Catholic to the Pope than to the people of England. And they were skeptical, many of the people, especially the parliamentarians, were skeptical that Charles I, though a Protestant, was actually going to maintain the independence of the Church of England for a few reasons. First, his wife, Henrietta Maria, uh, was the youngest daughter of King Henry IV of France, was a practicing Catholic. Second, Charles wanted to impose more uniformity on the whole Church of England and introduced a Book of Common Prayer in 1637 that introduced more Catholic aspects to the liturgy. This is known as High Anglicanism. This led to backlash by Scottish presbyters that opted for a less rigid structure um, and eventually war between this, uh, known as the Bishop's War. Uh, and there was generally a feeling among the, Engli among the English people that Charles wanted to make England Catholic again. There's also, overshadowing this religious dispute, a political dispute between the monarchy and Parliament. In 1628, uh, Parliament issued what's known as the Petition of Right, that argued for greater power to Parliament as a check against the King's unlimited authority. In response, Charles dissolved Parliament and didn't summon a new Parliament until 1640. 
This was a period of time known as personal rule, in which the king both ended a war against France, instituted religious reforms, tried to resolve the bishop's war against Scotland, all without funding from Parliament, and all of which created a sense of distrust around him. When he finally recalled Parliament in 1640, he dissolved it in a few weeks, um, when, par uh, when Parliament tried to use the king's financial situation to leverage more power. Eventually, uh, in November of 1640, he basically was bankrupt and had to recall Parliament again in order to fund the monarchy. And this became known as the Long Parliament, um, uh, as it maintained power throughout the, uh, the English Civil Wars. The king attempted to arrest several members of this parliament in 1642, but when that failed, he withdrew from London. Uh, parliament then raised an army to fight against the king's uh, cavalier army, and we actually had full-out war in, the, in this English Civil Wars. Finally, there was also a fiscal conflict. The personal rule created immense amount of debt. Um, and then there was a debate about the need for parliamentary approval. Because the king was dependent on parliament for finances, uh, Charles, despite the period of per personal rule, was constrained in his actions. And this led to him ending military involvement on the continent of Europe and trying to use various means of circumventing parliament. And these included taxes on coastal and port communities known as ship money, uh, originally ended to uh, expanded these taxes that were originally intended to pay for uh, coastal defense and defense of ports and shipping lanes, all the way to try to circumvent Parliament and raise money for his army, for his treasury. Uh, many historians have uh, challenged these traditional accounts of the causes of civil wars that painted as a more or less progressive movement towards republicanism, uh, and and have and there's a kind of move in Marxist historiography that argued that uh, Parliament was actually siding with the emerging bourgeoisie, uh, the industrialists and non-aristocratic landholders against the old forms of feudal political and religious power, um, and so. We're not going to solve any of these historiographical questions, but it's something to keep in mind. More importantly for us, or just as importantly at, at least, uh, we want to think about some of the consequences of the English Civil Wars. First is there was a the trial and execution of King Charles I. Uh, there was a long debate within Parliament as to whether or not to negotiate with Charles or and receive him on the throne with a form of kind of constitutional monarchy, or to get rid of the monarchy altogether and have a republican government. Uh, eventually, uh, Parliament purged itself of any royalist-leaning members of Parliament, and this became known as the Rump Parliament, and it established a high court to try Charles, I for, uh, Charles I for treason. Uh, in his def legal defense, he argued that this court had no jurisdiction over him due to the divine right of kings, um, and so because he um, gave no defense, he was found guilty uh, on January 27th, 1649, and sentenced to death. Um, he was executed then on January 30th, 1649, um, and this ultimately led to the replacement of the Stuart monarchy uh, and the foundation of the first Commonwealth of England, in which the Rump Parliament claimed sovereignty and government. But because of threats from both Scotland and Ireland, uh, the Rump Parliament ultimately empowered Oliver Cromwell to, and the Committee of Safety to lead the war effort. Ultimately, Cromwell disbanded the Rump Parliament in 1653 and established uh, what's known as bare bones parliament which was a personally nominated assembly and basically got rid of the republican infrastructure and asserted dictatorial power th through the army uh, cromwell then led a violent war against the irish motivated by political and religious reasons that included the massacre of both soldiers and civilians and in the wake of the war all catholic owned land was confiscated in ireland and redistributed to english settlers uh, eventually uh, after C cromwell's death his son was forced to give up the protectorate the Long Parliament was destroyed and created the constitutional framework for the restoration of the Stuart monarchy under Charles II. And Cromwell was posthumously beheaded for treason. Ultimately, the Stuart monarchy was restored in 1660. Parliament actually invited Charles II back under a revised constitutional framework to rule as the monarch. Sorry about that. Ultimately, this saga concludes in the Glorious Revolution of 1688, in which the Stuart monarchy would again be overthrown, this time by William of Orange, in the Glorious Revolution that would greatly empower Parliament. And we'll talk about this next week. So thinking about, the context, thinking about this context, we can turn to Thomas Hobbes' life. Uh, before that, 
I've, I'm going to upload some additional background material on the English Civil War if you are interested. Uh, there's an overview lecture by an English historian on the English Civil War that will be up from you, that is available on YouTube. Uh, I will upload that link on Moodle. You'll be able to find it as well. If you're interested in, in going into a much deeper dive on the causes, the, his, the kind of progress, and the consequences of the English Civil Wars, check out the Revolutions Podcast's first season. And just for fun, Monty Python's Oliver Cromwell song is a good, uh, lighthearted take on the, this uh, period of history. Again, all of these links are available on the Moodle page. So turning to Thomas Hobbes, he was born in Malmesbury, England in 1588, uh, and he claimed, uh, he wrote of his of his own birth, that my mother gave birth to twins, myself in fear. He was born prematurely as the Spanish Armada was invading England, um, which is why he later in his life uh, wrote that his mother gave birth to himself in fear. He himself received a traditional scholastic education, um, but he was also exposed to continental science and history for, from uh, he uh, from he eventually toured Europe between 1610 and 1615, um, and was exposed to a great num a number of authors that were involved in the recovery of Greek and Latin thought. His first major publication was the tr as a translation of Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War from Latin into English in 1628, uh, uh, or sorry, from uh, from Greek into English, and this was the first English translation of the History of the Peloponnesian War. He also wrote a series of, uh, of essays prior to the English Civil Wars, but the main uh, piece that, we're, that he's known for is, the, is what we're reading this week, Leviathan. And this was written over the course of the Civil Wars, but not published until 1651, while, uh, while Thomas Hobbes himself was in uh, Paris. While he was there, he had the company of many exiled royalists. It was originally published in English but then in 1651, but then republished in Latin, and Hobbes himself did the translation in 1668. Now, before we turn to the text itself, it's important to, I want to do a little bit of a setup to, uh, to the ground what we're going to be talking about. And the first is thinking about the way that, you should be thinking about the way that Hobbes revises three key concepts we've seen in classical or ancient political theory. The first is the relationship between individuals and the community, as we saw from Plato and Aristotle, Al-Farabi and Confucius. But there's a great, more, great deal of emphasis placed in all of these thinkers on the community over the individual. Second, what does reason and rationality mean for Hobbes? Um, it's a much more instrumental form of rationality than the platonic focus on like the form of the good or focusing on like the whole, or that there's some sort of like normative account of justice in our reasoning. Finally, Hobbes embraces um, a child of the scientific revolution, embraces what's known as a mechanistic conception of nature, rather than thinking of nature as this um, teleological, purpose-driven, Aristotelian form of nature. He thinks that all of nature, including human beings, are ultimately just atoms bouncing around in the void. Another thing to keep in think about while reading, while listening to this lecture, while thinking through these ideas, is what is the role of science in geometric proof that Hobbes really tries to make his argument a deductive geometric proof? And how should we read this kind of proof of political authority that we get in Hobbes? On the one hand, we can take Hobbes at his word and that he is actually deducing the scientific foundations of political authority from basic principles. But we can also think about what why the invocation of scientific and geometric proof, how this might be a rhetorical strategy. What What is this accomplishing for Hobbes by when he says that this is a simply a deduction of political principles from, from the first principles about human nature? So that's just to get us started. This would be a great time if you want to take a break, pause this video, come back to it. Um, the next thing we're going to be talking about is Hobbes conception of human psychology. So with any good work, it's good to start with the introduction to that work. And Hobbes' introduction on page 9, 10, and 11 provides a good 
kind of way to start thinking about the, the distinctions that Hobbes himself is drawing between him and the classical tradition of political theory. Nature, he writes, the art whereby God hath both and made and governs the world is by the art of man as in many other things, so in this also imitated that it can make an artificial animal. For seeing life is but a motion of limbs, the beginning whereof is in some principal part within, why may we not say that all autonoma have artificial life? For what is the heart but a spring, and the nerves but so many strings, and the joints but so many wheels, giving motion to the whole body, such as was intended by the artificer? Art goes yet further, imitating the rational and most excellent works of nature, man. By, and for by art the, is created the great Leviathan, called the commonwealth or state, which is but an artificial man, though of greater strength and stature than the natural, for whose protection and defense it was intended, and in which the sovereignty is an artificial soul, as giving life and motion to the whole body. Now, there's a few important things going on in this passage here, where he talks about the human body as a machine, as, as, as nature and artifice working together, as sovereignty, as our political systems, the state, as an artificial human being. We can, draw, uh, we can draw three kind of main conclusions, and I'll summarize these at the end. But first, um, we have a mechanistic conception of nature. He describes life as nothing more than the motion of limbs, that he thinks that we are all kind of automata. He's not saying that there's any sort of inherent purpose. There's no teleology. There's no value in nature. Everything is just mechanism. Everything is just material. Everything is just atoms. And second, that includes human beings. He says that our heart is nothing but a string, our nerves nothing but strings, joints nothing but wheels, that we are no different than anything else in nature. We don't have some higher purpose. We are not like Aristotle and political animals. We are just fancier forms of nature. And, for, and the third is that just as nature creates humans, Humans create an artificial person of the sovereign. And here, what he's trying to argue is that politics is a creation of human beings. It is an artificial creation. It is not something like Aristotle that we are naturally drawn to, but something that we create. So these are the, th just from this introduction, we already have three really in important distinctions that Hobbes is drawing. First, that nature is a mechanism, not a teleological purpose-driven whole. Second, that humans are material creatures, no different than other animals. And third is that politics is artificial. It's not natural. It's the work of human beings. So from this basic conception, we can turn to Hobbes' account of human psychology. And while we're talking about this, be thinking about how this is different from Plato's tripartite conception of the soul, Al-Farabi's discussion of the human faculties, uh, or Aristotle's account of human virtue. So human reasoning for Hobbes, he says on page 32, is nothing but reckoning. And he adds that that is adding and subtracting of the consequences of general names agreed upon for the marking and signifying of thoughts. That reasoning for Hobbes follows a consequential logic. It's entirely deductive from first principles. It's like following a proof in your geometry classes. It's like working through a logical proof uh, where you are just not where you're just kind of guided by simple axiomatic laws of logic or cause and effect. And therefore, he says, there can be no certainty of the last conclusion without a certainty of all those affirmations and negations on which it is grounded and inferred. And what he means here is that if our first principles aren't certain, then all of our conclusions are going to be false. And this is mo entirely what he's trying to do in this work of Leviathan, is to kind of cure us from all of our false conceptions of what human beings are, what our natural state is, and how we relate to each other in political society. That we've made a lot of false conclusions by beginning from false premises, and that instead we need to start from new principles. The challenge is that most of our, um, most of our conclusions are based on absurdity and error. That we've 
and uh, he writes on he gives us a list of nonsense words on page 34 and is very critical of metaphors tropes and rhetorical figures on page 35 all of these which confuse us and make us liable to make bad reasoning when we start to use invoking ideas like for him a free will or an immortal soul or any any sort of supernatural or immaterial or religious um, ideas that they lead us to false conclusions about what human nature is. Now, many have pointed out that this is very ironic since Hobbes' entire book is based on a metaphor of the state as a leviathan, a giant sea monster, and we'll talk about that next class. So this is a distinct ideal of human reason from Plato and Al-Farabi. There's no kind of intellectual intuition there's no like ascending the height out of the cave for Plato or reaching the kind of divine revelation for Al-Farabi. It's all about re like a kind of mathematical or logical reasoning and following the consequences. And we'll talk about it in a little bit um, that there is, this is also different from Aristotle. That what he what we decision making is for Hobbes is very different than Aristotle's account that we saw in the Politics Book One of deliberating based on what is good or just uh, as the essence of human deliberation. Ultimately, for Hobbes, however, human beings aren't purely rational. Unfortunately, we are also driven by passions, what he calls these small beginnings of motion within the body of man before they appear in walking, speaking, striking, and other visible actions. That we are not always driven by rational conclusions, but we are driven by our appetites, our desires, our fears, our hopes. And so he argues that all, a lot of our motivation and all, a lot of our behavior, we don't have good reasons for. We're just driven by these passions that begin with these simple passions of desire, love, aversion, hate, joy, and grief. Uh, and then they become com com combined into more complex passions. So, uh, for example, on page 42, Hobbes discusses the idea, the passion of vainglory. So if you turn your, your book here on the bottom of page 42... It says, joy arising from the imagination of a man's own power and ability is the exaltation of the mind, which is called glorying, which if grounded upon the experience of his own former actions is the same with confidence, but if grounded on the flattery of others or only supposedly by oneself for delight and consequences of it is called vainglory. And here we can see how an unwarranted confidence in your own ability can lead you to search for glory in vain. Uh, you can over, you can be driven by the passion and desire for glory to make errors in judgment. He also is, describes pity, for example, on the next page. Grief for the calamity of another is pity, and ariseth from the imagination that the like calamity may befall himself, and therefore is called also compassion. And in the phrase of this present time, a fellow feeling. And therefore, for calamity arriving from great wickedness, the best men have the least pity, and for the same calamity, those have least pity, that they think that, that think themselves least obnoxious to the same. And so our our, our passions are, uh, are are not rational. Uh, they are driven by our hopes and our fears, and they drive our human behavior in ways that we don't aren't always aware of. And so another thing that Hobbes is trying to do here is trying to move us from being driven blindly by our passions to making rational decisions, making uh, intelligent decisions. What we're doing when we're making decisions for Hobbes is what many have called a minimalist conception of decision making. He says that in deliberation, the last appetite or aversion immediately adhering to the action or to the omission thereof is that we call the will the act of willing. There's no independent faculty of the will. There's no spirited fa uh, faculty of the soul like in Plato. There's no deliberation like in Aristotle about the good and the just. It is simply whatever appetite or aversion happened to be before we act. That's all our will is. It is not independent and it is not something that we have control over. For Hobbes, there's no such thing as like a free will that we think about our actions and then we choose our actions. That we are just kind of deterministic machines following a computer program of passions and whichever one wins out, that is what we have decided to do. So there's no kind of classical conception of a virtuous will or cultivating a good will. So we can't really think of ourselves as political animals in the same way that Aristotle does 
because we don't actually deliberate about what is good and just. We don't actually make choices in the same way. So our knowledge of the world and our judgments are always going to be consequential and conditional. Uh, he says on page 49, uh, or for, sorry, 47, that what we that no discourse whatsoever can end in absolute knowledge of fact, past, or to come. For the knowledge of consequence, which I have called science, is not absolute, but conditional. That all we can kind of do is follow this train of logic. We can't have Plato or Al-Farabi's absolute knowledge. At best, we can have knowledge from experience and prudence. And this, But this also means he writes on page 49, um, that we have to be careful about where we get our first principles from. He says, from whence we may infer that when we believe any saying whatsoever it be to be true, from arguments taken not from the thing itself or from the principles of natural reason, but from the authority and good opinion we have of him that hath said it, then that is, then it is the speaker or person we believe in or trust in, and whose word we take the object of our faith, and honor done in believing is done to him only. Now, this is a very archaic way of saying we have to be careful about where we get our for our principles from or where we get our beliefs from. That, And he's including in here things like religious texts, uh, political authorities. There's a lot going on here that, sign, uh, that we have to critique traditional authority and things we are told because when we believe them, we're not actually honoring the authority of the thing itself, but simply the thing, that, the person who told us that. Instead, we have to kind of strip all of our preconceptions down and reason from first principles of experience or from natural reason. So what is human, human motivation ultimately? And this is from section 111, which isn't in your assigned reading. He says, ultimately, our motivation is a desire for power and a fear of death. He says... I put for all general inclination of all mankind a perpetual and restless desire of power after power that ceaseth only in death. And the cause of this is not always that a man hopes for a more intensive delight than he has already attained, or that he cannot contend with a moderate power, but because he cannot assure the power and means to live well, which he hath present without the acquisition of more. That Ultimately, we have a desire for power because we are afraid, that we are uncertain about what our ability to maintain a good life, to maintain our lives and our well-being, and that we desire more and more power in order to secure ourselves. And this is the fundamental human motivation for Hobbes. Now, we'll talk about the implications of grounding human behavior in the fear of death and desire for power in just a second, but this is now a good time to take a break. Pause this, uh, pause this lecture, come back to it when you have time. So, part three of this lecture is going to talk about Hobbes on human nature or the state of nature. This is uh, what many attribute to Hobbes uh, inventing, and this is the question of, this is the thought experiment of what human beings would be like in a natural state prior to any social relations or political institutions, what were the first humans really like? And while this is often accredited to Hobbes as inventing this idea, it dates back to the ancient Chinese thinker Mozi, uh, who, who was writing in 470, who lived between 470 and 391 BCE, uh, who also kind of developed a similar thought experiment of what did we look like? What did, how did we behave? What were we like before we lived in society? And so what Hobbes is trying to do here is figure out what is essentially human, what are the essential factors and behaviors of human beings, and then how can we ground political authority on that. This begins with the discussion of equality, that men are fundamentally equal in both body and mind. And, while the, and so we already see a massive break between the, the classical conception. He says that no matter how different much stronger one person might be from another on the top of page 87, that we always have to sleep and that that someone else, either by secret machination or by confederacy with others, can always overpower us, that none of us are going to be able to maintain our bodily strength against others, that we're, none of us are immortal or invulnerable. And he says that, look, in our mental faculties, some people are a little smarter and a little and a little less smart, 
uh, but for the most part, that they are equal, and where they are unequally, where there seems to be inequalities in mental faculties, it's really just a function of experience. That this is because some people have been given greater education, some people have been given more, uh, ex more, more, no more, more access, exposure and access to knowledge. But ultimately, our mental faculties are very similar, if not equal. However. Rather than ground, turning this equality into a, you know, a happy utopia, he, he writes on page 87, From this equality of ability ariseth equality of hope in the attaining of our ends. And therefore, if any two men desire the same thing, which nevertheless they cannot both enjoy, they become enemies, and in the way to their end endeavor to destroy or subdue one, each, one another. From the, the, this equality that we have means that we both are all confident in our ability to uh, achieve our own desires, and this leads to conflict and violence because no one person is able to create enough fear to subdue everyone else. And so we each, knowing that we are uh, liable to die, try to beat the other person in order to secure our own lives. And so rather than kind of a natural sociality that we get with Aristotle, for Hobbes, the state of nature is a state of war, that men have no pleasure in keeping company where there's no power to overawe them all, that we don't like to live with each other without some sort of um, po powerful state to maintain order. And during this time, uh, we are live in a constant state of war, of all, every man against every other man, he writes on page 88. And this war is not just simply in the actual fighting, but in the disposition there too. So that's a constant state of war, even when it appears peaceful. And here on page, um, sorry, this is on page 89, uh, we see probably some of the most famous, one of Hobbes' most famous account, uh, accounts of the state of war. Whatsoever, therefore, is consequent in a time of war, where every man is enemy to every man, the same is consequent to that time, wherein men live without other security, and that with their own strength and their own invention shall furnish them with all. In such a condition there is no place for industry, because the fruit thereof is uncertain, and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation, nor use of commodities that there may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So it's not just the fear of violent death, but it's, there's no industry, there's no arts and culture, there's no, there's nothing that gives meaning to life without a sense of security. So this constant state of war is a constant state of fear such that we can't live a good and meaningful and flourishing life. And, to, and in this state of nature, in this state of war, we see Thrasymachus rearing his head once again. For in this state of war, there's no such thing as justice and injustice. That there are no uh, that they're without a common power, without a government or a state to issue laws that are binding, that there's no such thing as justice or injustice. Because we are all equal, there's no one that can actually enforce the laws of justice. And therefore, uh, in the same condition, he says, there can be no proprietary, propriety, no dominion, no mine and thine distinct, but only that be every man's that he can get for so long as he can keep it. That it's every person for themselves and with no sense of justice to restrain our actions. But he does think that there is some sort of natural law, and it's grounded not on abstract philosophical reason, but by prudence and experience, that precisely because we fear death, we are inclined to peace, and therefore we have a desire to do the things to live in peace. And these, this, th these uh, reasons suggest, he says, certain articles of peace, which is what he calls the laws of nature, is which, which we'll t uh, close today's lesson with. So Hobbes revision, revises on page 91 several key ideas from the classical tradition. First, he describes the right of nature, that everyone can use his own power as he will himself to the preservation of his own nature. That we have an unlimited right to do anything. Second, he says that he defines liberty not as the ability to make a choice of your own free will, but simply the absence of external impediments. This will come back next class when we talk about the freedom in, in the Commonwealth. Finally, he describes the law of nature not as some abstract universal platonic good, but as a general rule found out by reason 
by which a man is forbidden to do that which is destructive to his own life. But these are rules of thumb that maintain our life. So he draws three conclusions from this. First, that every man has a right to everything, even to one another's body. That there is no natural right uh, against, there's no natural law against harming another as long as it preserves your own life. However, because we don't want to die a nasty, violent death, we have the first law of nature is to seek peace. We are inclined, we want to seek peace. We want to get out of the state of war. And if we can't, the second law of nature says, by all means, we can defend ourselves. So that is what the laws of nature are. Escape the state of war and find peace. And if you can't, defend yourself with any means you can. So what is justice for Hobbes? Ultimately for Hobbes, it's nothing more than keeping one's contracts. A contract, a, what he calls here a covenant, is what establishes what is just. It's an agreement between, two, there's no such thing as justice outside of an agreement between two people over what should be done. That is all justice is, and so you need to have a contract in order to have this sense of justice. However, contracts are impossible in the state of nature. We don't have some fear of a course of power to make us actually fulfill our contracts. Um, that because we have a right to resist and defend oneself and a right, unlimited right to another's bodies, we, a contract is going to be insufficient to prevent, to actually hold us to our oaths. That we will break the contract if, if we think that it will be advantageous to us. And he says on page 99 that the force of words is being too weak to hold men to performance of their covenants. Just because we swear an oath, that does not add anything. And so within the state of nature, the only hope for justice is to create a contract to write down a law to bind us to each other. But there is no hope for that contract to be enforceable, that we need some coercive power to enforce these laws, to move us out of the state of war into a state of peace. And that's the answer that Hobbes provides in Book Two of Leviathan with the develop with the idea of the sovereign. So next class, we're going to read his account of the social contract and political authority. Where does sovereignty come from, and what are the powers of the sovereign? Um, while you're reading uh, chapters 17 through 21, think about the sources of legitimacy for Hobbes and the powers of the sovereign. Now, once you've finished uh, listening to watching this lecture, uh, turn to, go to Moodle and go ahead and get started on today's discussion post. Describe how Hobbes compares and contrasts to the, to the classical understanding of human nature and political authority. Focus on one of the following concepts, either human nature, human reason and decision making, or justice. How does Hobbes, how is Hobbes similar to and how is he different from the, the classical conception? If you have an odd ID number, you'll post a 200 word response uh, by 1159 tonight, March 23rd. If you have an even number, take a look at your peers' responses and write a 100 uh, word reply uh, by 1159 tomorrow, March 24th. Thank you for tuning in to this lecture. I hope that this helped clarify some of the intricacies of Hobbes' argument. I look forward to the discussion section. As always, feel free to let me know if you have any questions, and I will see you next class.